So, uh, why should you apply for an authorization? Essentially, an overview of the process very quickly, and then essentially to prepare or not to prepare an application. That's the question, and then a couple of take-home messages. The process here, um, is there a point? Is it the red one, the point? Yes, okay. So you have the way of uh, getting uh, uh, substances to uh, uh, Annex 14, which is this part, so step 1.1, one, 1.2. One, one, one we are not discussing that at all here today. We are discussing you make an application, get opinions from RAC and SEAC, and goes to the Commission, and then there's a decision from the author for the authorization. There's public consultation there. And this takes about two years. Uh, okay. Uh, a bit more detail, the application process. Uh, here's where the application comes in. So you have something called pre-submission information session possibility. In other words, talk to the Secretariat about different aspects of the uh, application, how it works. We can give you advice on that part, not on the content, of course, of the application, but on the process information needs. Then it comes in over here, and we have then a public consultation on the broad information uses, the stuff that I showed you earlier, get comments, and then there's something called a trialogue, which is the RAC and SEAC rapporteurs together with the applicant uh, may or may not discuss, depending on the case, or forget to get clarified things, and get the draft opinion, maximum 10 months uh, for the application uh, uh, of the application, and then the applicant can comment the draft opinion, and, if it, and then finally it's uh, finalized over here. As you can see, depending on uh, the, if the applicant comments or doesn't comment, the, the timelines change a little bit at the end. Uh, earlier I said that we are doing this whole process at the moment on the average in seven months, not uh, in the 14 months, which is the maximum. Uh, but, of course, there are variations. Sometimes four months, sometimes it's uh, the full full 14 months. And then it's the Commission decision, which takes its own time, obviously, and then, then it's published in the official journal and becomes part of the European law. Um, the applicants, who can they be? Well, they can be almost anybody who's, who's using the substance, obviously, manufacturer, imported, downstream user, only representative, or any combination of the above. And I think we've seen it all so far already. Uh, an application... For authorization can be submitted by one or for, or for one or several uses or for one uh, or several groups of substances. And you can just imagine that this becomes like a, easily like a Swiss cheese if a lot of people are applying for a lot of different kinds of things, but I'm not applying for that and so on. So some pragmatism, I think, is also prevailing in applicants' side to ensure that the applicants are kind of are coherent packages. And that's what they've been so far. There's been very little of this sort of... Uh, we don't really know what's going on uh, in terms of the, the application, so that's been good so far. Now, the key question is to prepare, prepare or not to prepare for an application. And the simple question, why should you apply? And I think the answer is, in a sense, very simple. You should apply in case the uh, use of the substance adds value in the European Union and the risks related to the use of substance are sort of low, whatever low means. Uh, and obviously should not apply it if the value added is not very high and, and the risks are relatively high. Now that's easier to say and done, but that's, I think it's good to keep that in mind. Uh, if it's a substance which is important to you or your customers for one, uh, uh, one or the other reason, then you should apply. The key questions. When you are identifying the impact for the substance of being listed in Sunday 14, uh, or, or and keeping, uh, which need be of, of course authorized. And when you're assessing whether the impacts of the authorization should be bigger or smaller than the benefits, which is the key question, when you're deciding whether you should apply uh, for any authorization or not, and if you manufacture the substance, import it or use it on your processes, um, the key question is at the end of the day, what is the impact of my, to my business if I do not get the authorization. In other words, if I can no longer use it. And this is something which I, we know this is time and time again quite difficult for companies because they've been using the substance for such a long time. But if you start asking what would happen if I cannot have it, then you usually, and put a lot of people around it, you usually get actually the options quite, quite easily mapped out, qualitatively at least. And if you don't 
get the authorization, what would then happen? Well, you switch, switch to other substances, adapt the technologies, uh, use additional inputs maybe, switch products, import products, change the specification or stop producing or using. Something like that would be happening. And what would be, then the impacts be? And there are some, some ideas of, about the impacts. The point of this slide is actually not, not what is above, but at what is at below. Uh, these are not uh, uh, sort of health and, and uh, environmental compliance issues or environmental issues. These are actually core business issues. And this is something we've noticed, again, that has been sometimes difficult for companies when authorization has been dealt like any other environmental legislation and then it's sort of farmed out to the sort of environmental and safety and health part of the company, said, OK, you deal with it. But this is not the way we believe it should work. It should actually be more a board discussion whether we want to continue or not strategically to use the substance and under what circumstances and then make a business decision whether to apply or not. And this has been, at least in some cases, and, and maybe in many cases, an issue that, that has created in the beginning some, some difficulties in companies, just internally. They haven't understood that it's a core business issue. Um, now, uh, the case for the authorization is, in theory, quite clear. Uh, so if the avoided costs... Uh, uh, if you avoid costs, uh, cost increases, if... Uh, uh, you, I mean, if you, use, if you use another substance or another technology, of course, you would be hang, having higher costs. And uh, the benefit, of course, of, of the authorization is not to get those costs. Uh, it can also be that there's, for instance, some environmental impacts. The alternatives are more energy um, inefficient, for instance, and so on. So there might be some environmental issues related to that as well. Um, but, but overall, the, the, the whole benefit is, uh, of the authorization is that you avoid the costs of the, uh, of the alternative uh, use. And that may be difficult to calculate, but that's the key question in one, says, one sense. And then the other one is, what is the environmental health impact of using the substance? That tends to be easier because you've been dealing with the substance already. And remember that the risk can be uh, sort of zero if, they are adequate, if the risks are adequately controlled for th threshold substances. Um, now, the, the key here is that um, the authorization is more likely when the costs of the alternatives are high or higher and the current risks are controlled or very controlled. And the authorization is more likely, obviously, the, the clearer the case is, the bigger the difference between the, the benefits and risks is. And obviously, uh, uh, the clearer you can make, the simpler you can make the case, the better. Uh, it doesn't, it's not the length of pages, but the quality of the argument that matters. Um, when you uh, go through the process, this is, might be a bit counterintuitive, but it's good to maybe make this in the beginning. Uh, you might estimate the environmental and health risks are greater than the costs of the alternative uh, options. And actually, this is the counterintuitive part, I think. Great. You've just noticed uh, uh, that author authorization is unlikely, and you have saved yourself the application cost. Meaning there's something wrong, uh, wrong in the sense of in the in the underground logic to get an authorization, you have to do something else. Now, you might find uh, uh, viable alternatives when you do the analysis of alternatives, and an option for instance which is cheaper or better for you one way or the other. And again, great, you've found something which is better for you at the moment, and you have saved the application cost and all the hassle of application. And then only once you sort of realize that if these two don't actually match, you, you might find that the cost of the alternatives exceeded the current risks. And then you have a case for authorization. And in a sense, you've done the analysis and just essentially click, click here and apply. And that logic, obviously, is, is very business dependent, how, how you come to that conclusion. Um, here, the... Uh, main point of this slide is actually that when you're doing the analysis of alternatives, it is not actually a very separate exercise from the socioeconomic analysis. And you can see here that uh, in analysis of alternatives, we talk about technical feasibility and economic feasibility and availability of the alternatives. And this is pretty much the same thing as the economic impacts of uh, if you're applying for an authorization. 
And then at the same time, on the analysis of alternatives, you have a section called uh, reduction of overall risk, which is a bit difficult to see on the slide at the moment. It's over there. And that's pretty much the same thing as the uh, human health and environmental impacts. Excuse me. And, and for this reason, we actually made, made a, a recently a, a new format, which is now joining the analysis of alternatives and socioeconomic analysis. And of course, we would be interested during today and tomorrow to hear if any one of you is using that and if you find that actually uh, helpful, because we, the idea was to make it easier to document and therefore easier to read as well for the, for the committees. Okay, now when you're analyzing the options and the impacts and they tell you um, whether you have, um, they should be able to tell you whether you have a case uh, for authorization. And you've done essentially all the, week, uh, all the stuff uh, correctly. And then comes another thing that maybe people haven't thought about. The world might be actually wider than your business. You've, you're quite sure that you are okay but you need to think about also what your competitors do. Because you might actually get an authorization for something where there is an alternative, not for you, but for somebody else, and they actually would take your market. So you have to look at the, the, uh, also the immediate commercial technical environmental context. Uh, I mean, sorry, wider than the immediate commercial and technical environmental context. Because once you've done that, this could actually make, may actually in, increase your, uh, the, the chances of getting your author authorization because those kinds of questions will come in during the, the opinion making clearly. Because if there's a competitor who's doing something similar to what you're doing, not necessarily the same, and you haven't thought about it during public consultation, this information will come on board and the committees will rightly start asking questions. So it's good to also stop there before you apply. Then there might be some other factors affecting the application. Uh, for instance, it takes time to do that. It requires significant resources. Uh, the application fee is not insignificant. It just guarantees an opinion, not authorization. Authorization is temporary. You have to reapply uh, after the review period. And you have the market trends, uh, you have the competition, and you have the suppliers. What, what if everybody else is substituting? Will you be uh, left behind? I hope this is not scaring you, but it's good, to, good to more, rather to say to you that these are issues that it's, it will be good for business, from business point of view to think about. So take home. Uh, you should apply uh, if the user substance clearly adds value and the risk, remaining risks are small. That's kind of a no-brainer, but it's good to repeat that. The first question is not how to apply for the authorization. And I think, by the way, here comment, I think, I hope companies are moving, in a sense, in this respect, that they are actually reflecting much more about really what will happen to my business if I do no longer get, uh, if I no longer can use the author, uh, Annex 14 substance. So it's not the first how to apply, but rather what will happen and then decide whether one needs to apply or not. The third is that the authorization concerns your core business. You need to own it and you cannot leave it only to the, uh, the environmental departments or consultants to deal with because it's not a compliance issue. And it's, fourth, it's very important to think outside your business to find the right scope for the assessment, both commercially, economically, and environmentally. So it's not all about your business, it's about the business of the supply chain. And a strong case for authorization probably means an easy application. The more marginal, more sort of iffy the case comes, the more resources and time and analysis and etc. the application will need. So, a couple of sort of high-level advices. Start preparing early, obviously. Involve the whole supply chain up and down. Get familiarized with the guidance and all other documents we have, the submission tools, the manuals, the formats, and so on. Be use-oriented. This, again, I think is working quite well nowadays. People are use-oriented, but still. Please contact us as, as early as you can by notifying us that you're thinking about applying so we know what the pipeline looks like and request for the so, this so-called pre-submission information session that we hold. We recommend usually at least half a year before, before you, we meet us. It will be most helpful for you. And ask ECHO for technical advice, for instance, through the help desks. Please make suggestions to us and we listen and we will act. So that's for my part. Thank you very much. <laughs>